Welcome back everyone. In our 2.30 slot, we have Hagen Berghaus. Hagen is an avid outdoorsman who believes the more remote, the better. He also owns and operates Tyrrell Sports at Hotham. He has previously been a member of the Australian Special Forces and has spent a lot of time backcountry ski touring in Europe, the US and Australia. He counts the highlight of his outdoor experience as mountaineering in Le Grave, France. Hagen is currently developing a backcountry guiding business based out of Hotham. Over to you, Hagen. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it, mate. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll just start uh, talking a bit about me um, and my experience and sort of what got us to the point where we're at here up at Hotham. And uh, yeah, so my background, as Daniel mentioned, was uh, I was in the Australian Special Forces for several years and um, yeah, got into a bit of ski mountaineering and whatever after in Europe and sort of spent oh, the better part of, I guess, 10 years uh, ski mountaineering and getting dragged around the mountain by a bunch of Canadians and Austrians and Germans and Danes. And uh, yeah, as was mentioned, the highlight was probably... Uh, doing some pretty gnarly stuff, some mountaineering in uh, Le Grave, France. So yeah, that was that was pretty awesome. So what I'm gonna to talk to you today about, excuse the notes, I've just written it down, is about um, the, the, firstly the definition of backcountry, um, based on my experiences very much this season because there's been no lifts running. And then a little bit about the practical aspects of uh, of planning a trip, I guess. Um, and the more I sort of read about it and researched it and, and thought about it, um, there really is a lot a lot of preparation needed uh, to get out there and do it well, I think. Um, and I guess I'm trying to combine or simplify uh, several years of experience into, I guess, 20 minutes. Um, but yeah, I'll give it a crack and cover a few topics. So what we're gonna cover is trip planning, uh, group dynamics, gear selection, and, and risk management. Um, but as I said, the first thing I'm going to clarify is that this is for uh, a backcountry setting or scenario. So whether it be Australia, uh, Europe, US, wh wherever, I guess, um, it, it's, it's out where there's no people, there's no peace help, there's no ski patrol or anything like that. You're beyond the boundaries. There may or may not be mobile reception. Um, so, I mean, you can absolutely apply this to walking up and skinning up the piece or whatever or inbounds uh, and use some of those planning tools. But the depth we're sort of going into is, is really defined or is aimed specifically at, uh, yeah, being out away from a, a help. All right, so trip planning. So the first thing we start with is who. Uh, who who's going on your trip and uh, what, what their strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, and, and everybody has strengths and weaknesses, uh, me included. And you gotta be really honest with yourself when you're planning these things. Um, yeah, and, and honest and open with the group of people you're going with, because you know you might be going with some people that are capable of skiing everything, you know, off piece switch and other people that are struggling to get down a blue run. And, and you need to, uh, and as we'll go on with later, um, be honest and open with each other um, about what your capabilities are, what your fears are, uh, and, and that'll position you well to get the most out of the trip. Um, and what to take. So what goes in your rucksack, what goes in your pockets, um, and how much to take. So there's, there is a very fine line between uh, carrying too much, not enough, uh, and being underprepared or possibly being overprepared. Um, obviously, being underprepared, if you're too cold or you're hungry, uh, yeah, you're left, you're left uh, perhaps with not enough energy to, uh, to, to complete what you're looking to do. Um, uh, and if you're carrying too much, you're potentially fatiguing yourself prematurely because yeah, you're carrying an extra, you know, liter or two of water that you didn't need or, or for example, um, and that, that's a lot of trial and error and um, yeah, working out what you need and what you don't need. And I, I, I won't go into the specifics of it, but I would always say as a general rule, like people say, oh, crampons, yes, no, this sort of thing. Um, if you've got them, 
like for that sort of thing take them they weigh a couple you know maybe a couple of hundred grams or something like that and uh from experience i've been trapped out there a couple of times well not trapped but uh yeah i've been in some pretty sketchy situations where i wish that i'd carried that extra 200 grams um doesn't matter how far it was uh and a big one that was brought up to me as well is, is a gear check, especially leading into the season where you haven't uh, used your gear in ages. Um, yeah, really going through everything, checking every screw, um, you know, every pocket, make sure your jackets work, you got your gloves, all your glove retainers and helmets and goggle lenses and, and all those tiny little one percenters, half percenters and stuff like that. Um, yeah, give it a good going over before the season. And even between missions, if it's been, you know, a week or two, since your last mission or whatever go through it again there's no harm in checking the screws on your bindings and to make sure everything's tight and you don't want to get out there and be about to drop some mad face and your binding falls off on you or something like that uh where so again being super meticulous about the details as in uh so off the top of my head i'd say like well let's why say we work in melbourne obviously not in the present time and uh we're going up to hotham for a weekend trip trip and you can say okay um ben and i are going to drive we're going to we're going to ride share and we're going to finish work on friday arbor we're going to be packed or whatever and uh, we're going to drive up to hoth where we're going to park so you, you're organizing all right we're going to camp beside the river in bright we're going to stay in bright we're going to stay at hotham um are we going to prep our gear before we get there after we get there in the morning we're going to do a super early start or whatever um yeah so just the details of how you're going to get there and and in as much as like are you going to go out along the the feather top um the razorback ridge and you know which runs are you going to do and if the situation changes are you going to change your mind on the way or are you just going to stick with the mission because that's what you want to do you know is there a big shootout off the side of feather top you want to go drop and come hell or high water that's what you're going to go do so yeah really really nut down right into the details of that and uh yeah be open with each other. Uh, if you're going out by yourself, obviously not. But if you're going out with a group of people, be open and honest. And yeah, discuss those finer details. It's about expectation management. Uh, when? So when you're going? So yeah, like I sort of touched on with the last point, is, is it a Friday night? Has everyone worked a full week? Um, how tired are people? How much motivation have people got? Is anyone carrying an injury? And, and very much the weather. Um, the weather is a massive one, obviously, mountains, clouds, fog, snow. Uh, it, it makes it, you know, we've got a very small window to do a lot of the stuff that we really want to do. So, uh, yeah. yeah, there's millions of resources out there, like uh, five, I don't know, I've got like nine or 10 apps on my phone that I cross check weather and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, checking all those. And this, this for me uh, is probably one of the really bigger ones. Like initially when I got into it, it was all about the skiing and the mission and stuff. But sort of as, I don't know, progressed along the way, it was the why, why are we going out there? What's our aim, you know? Like, because if you're in a group of say four or five people, everyone in their head has, has a different aim. They're thinking, yeah, I want to go out there because I want to ski this line because I, I'm, I'm a goal oriented person, for example. So I'm like, I want to go out and I want to ski that line come hell or high water. But there might be two other people in the group that are like, man, I love the view. I just want to walk along the ridge line and see the view. If we're not open with each other uh, and really transparent in our dialogue, um, you can set you, you, I mean, it doesn't have to, but it can set yourself up for failure and people get disappointed or it's expectation management. Um, because the plan might change and I might be devastated and the other two or three people in the group might be super happy. But um, yeah, so just be open and transparent about that. I think before you step off, um, usually best down the road for a couple of beers in a group setting, obviously COVID-19 aside, but uh, yeah, it, it really lets everyone know where you're standing um, and, what, and what the mission is. And, and look, it might turn out that on that discussion, which has done previously, that instead of going in one group of four people, it works out that you go in two groups of two. And that brings up the topic really quickly, um, just in case I forget it later. I think for me, the best number of touring people in a group is two, um, because you can't get outvoted. Because if you've got three, one says no, two says yes, generally the person that says no gets outvoted and goes has to go against their gut feel. Whereas um, if one person in the pair says no, it's a no go. So again, food for thought. Um, how? All right. 
this this is also a big one, um, especially it's back country. It's getting bigger and bigger, right? Um, we've definitely seen it this season. Uh, more and more people getting out there, you know, whether they're walking up the piste or whatever. Um, but, you know, they're buying gear, they're getting snowshoes, they're hiking and doing stuff that ordinarily wouldn't do. Um, the, the speed in which you travel over the snow, so snowshoes versus skins versus split boards, transitioning from one to the other. Um, again, it's, it comes down to expectation management, but I think um, walking with snowshoes and walking with skins over deep snow, the, the, it's not comparable. Like skis or split boards will fly way faster than snowshoes. I'm sure you get your super fit anomalies here and there, but generally speaking, um, with kick turns and angles and stuff like that, snowshoes are good, but they're, they're quite limited. Um, so yeah, planning that as well. So perhaps as I touched on before, or covered before, if you've got people that are snowshoeing and people that are skinning or whatever else, it might be better to split the group in two and meet up for lunch or, you know, have a potential base camp or something like that, rather than um, disappointing or slowing people down or whatever else. So again, it's all just food for thought. Uh, and the big one that keeps, I, I guess, the, it keeps coming up over and over again, it does it regardless of the topic, is preparation in, in fitness. Um, and, and for me, it starts like, or usually a couple of months out from the season, you know, you, you got stuck on more specific with your training or whatever else. Um, you really, if you're fit and, and you're prepared, like sure, you might not be fit to ski a thousand meters vertical or something like that, you know, that comes with being in the season, but you can be fit to walk, you can be fit to carry a backpack. You don't need to be in ski boots to do that. So that, that preparation, that, that hard yards before the season starts is really important because it's one less thing you've got to worry about. You know, you can then be worried about um, or thinking about how much fun you're having, you know, what gear you carried, maybe you should have carried your carrying ponds or maybe you shouldn't have. But yeah, with that fitness, if you've got that baseline that's taken care of, it's, um, yeah, it just makes life so much easier. And the, the really big one as well is um, what is the no-go criteria? So I, I, I think that's really got to be clearly defined as a group or even as an individual. Um, we use, we need to deal with it as an individual before, first before you deal with it in the group is what constitutes or what boxes have to be ticked before the no-go criteria is reached. For example, if the weather's bad, you know, if there's a massive crust on the snow or something like that, um, are they a no-go, you know? Um, if work's gone over or someone's family's, someone in the family's sick or whatever, it, it might be something like that, I don't know. But there's gotta be, I, I think, a clearly defined um, checklist and if, you know, those get checked, then it's off. It doesn't matter. There's always, it's always, there's, it's going to snow again. Um, there's always next season. Uh, it, it's not worth bending or breaking someone. Um, yeah, over something when it, it's probably not worth it in the scheme of things. And I guess it, to summarize all of that, those trip planning points would be um, just to get everyone on the same page so that everyone, their expectations are managed that you go, okay, we're leaving work on Friday and we're gonna go up and we're gonna do this. Um, we're gonna go out and we're gonna set up a base camp, the snowshoes are going together, the skiers and split boarders are going off to do their thing, but we're gonna meet up here at lunchtime, have lunch and reassess and see how we go. So something along those lines. All right, so um, if anyone's got any questions on that, you wanna write them in and I'll try and cover them in a, in a little bit. All right, so the next point is group dynamics. Um, and again, usually, I mean, there's a lot of forums out as well where people are meeting up with partners or buddies and whatever else and going backcountry skiing or touring for the first time or whatever, which is absolutely super cool. Um, but I would recommend in that situation, if that is you, to uh, do something pretty mellow to start with, you know, just uh, spend the day taking it quite easy, um, do some super chill stuff, get to know each other, what the capabilities are and all that sort of jazz. It's, um, yeah, before you go stepping out and doing some some gnarly stuff and uh, yeah, potentially get into a hair raising adventure with somebody you don't know much about. Um, even with your friends, like in a group of people with you've ridden or skied with before or whatever, um, it's, it's probably good to be open and ask, have you been in an emergency situation and, and what is that, you know? Um, and, and talk about that stuff so that it gives everyone a bit of a framework to understand, okay, well, well, Sam's in the group and Sam's done, you know, he was in a car accident, did really well, you know, like to control a situation or whatever, applied first aid, uh, something like that. And it, it, it gives everyone a pecking order and, and I guess definition or depth uh, 
to the character of the group uh, and will help with the dynamics so you know that, okay, if something goes wrong, you're the go-to whatever, workhorse, you're the go-to medical guy, et cetera, or girl, whatever. Um, and another big one is have the group ridden together before. Uh, and I would strongly recommend that, uh, yeah, anyone that's riding together, um, at least do a day or two of inbound stuff. I mean, sure you can go straight out in back country, but as I said before, keep it mellow, I would recommend. But um, yeah, do a couple of days in resort or inbounds or whatever and ride with each other and just see what your capabilities are. Like push the boundaries a little bit and just see and be okay, like, okay, that's, that's our limit. That's what we're going to go at. And uh, we're comfortable with that. You know, it might be people that are charging and go, Hey, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with the way they ride. I, I don't want to be part of that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just puts things into, into perspective. It's all well and good to sit around and, and talk about it over beers and have, have everyone say how awesome they are. But um, yeah, putting the wax on the snow and actually getting out there and doing it. Um, yeah. Often clears a lot of that stuff up and uh, yeah, s sorts the group out. Um, another one with group dynamics is realistic timelines. And a lot of it in my experience uh, has come down to probably fitness as well. Um, there's people who are absolutely amazing skiers or snowboarders or whatever, but they might not be the fittest people in the world. And so that potentially on the uphill they could suffer uh, a lot, but then send it on the downhill and, and vice versa. So I think, um, yeah, again, being transparent and open and talking about, you know, what sort of pace are we looking to go at um, and, and what are our goals and that sort of stuff for today, that, that helps set that stuff out. Also, uh, setting realistic expectations. So, you know, uh, are we going to get up uh, at 4.30 in the morning with headlamps or three o'clock in the morning and start with headlamps walking out along the Razorback Ridge and uh, to get out, you know, by nine or 10 o'clock or something like that? Or are we going to go and, you know, have a cruisy breakfast at the Jenny or something like that before we, before we get out there and ski some spring corn or whatever? Um, but really, again, we we'll keep harping on about it, but it's, yeah, that total transparency when you're planning your job or planning the mission or the, the day out, you just, yeah, talk to each other, be honest and say, look, this is what I want to do. What do you want to do? Okay, well, we're going together. So how about we, you compromise this, I compromise that and we end up doing this and we're both happy. All right, let's do that. Something like that. Uh, and the last one with group dynamics, which has actually made or broke a couple of, made, made and broken a few really uh, epic days was the appetite for risk. And again, this is, um, it's easy to talk stuff up sitting around uh, drinking beers and, and talking tough and stuff like that, or at least in my case, it has been anyway. Um, but yeah, once you get out, certain people, um, and, and there's nothing wrong with it, it is what it is, but there's certain people that have different appetites for it. You know, someone might be willing to ski a 60 degrees pure ice uh, thing that cliffs out underneath and be like, yeah, yeah, that doesn't worry me. And someone might be petrified. You probably don't want to go out and have the goal of getting to that point and doing it and then discovering that, well, in fact, 50% of the group doesn't want to do it. So yeah, that, that really needs to be talked about and, and be honest. And really, um, it's really a case of putting the ego uh, uh, aside and um, yeah, be, being honest with the group and talk when you're dealing with that stuff because yeah, you don't want to uh, sit, sell yourself short, I guess, but you don't want to oversell yourself at the same time. Um, and I, and I do think, yeah, anyway. Uh, all right. So again, any questions on the group dynamics, just chuck it in the chat and we'll get to them soon. Um, gear selection. All right. So the biggest one, so we own a shop, we ski, we do backcountry stuff all the time. Uh, we get a lot of people coming in that have bought stuff online. Absolutely no problem with it. Online stuff is awesome, but uh, we also do a lot of boot fitting and gear modification for people that have bought stuff online because it doesn't fit because they've read a review and the, the review says it's the best thing since sliced bread. And yeah, in, in actual fact, the ski is way too hardcore or not hardcore enough. Um, so yeah, I would say go into a store. Um, I, I truly believe there is a place for bricks and mortar in retail, uh, especially in these niche industries that we're in um, and speak to a salesperson and don't be scared. Like every good ski shop or outdoor store, everybody, everybody who's been into an outdoor store knows there's always a climber that works in there. There's always your whitewater rafter or whatever. It's exactly the same in the ski industry. Every good shop will have someone who's 
into racing or been a racer. So they can talk shop about race boots and stuff like that. Um, same with backcountry and split boarding and park and whatever. If you walk into a shop and ask for the salesperson and say, hey, um, I'd really like to talk to someone about backcountry stuff, who's the backcountry expert? And you don't get any results. They're like, I'm an Anaran. I mean, they might have some cool stuff, but go talk to another shop where you can actually talk shop with people and get some real experience because I mean, pre-COVID, Australia's pretty awesome. You know, we send people all around the world doing cool stuff and a lot of them come back here to work in, in small stores. And uh, there is a lot of corporate knowledge out there, um, but often it gets covered up by the big guys because of the fancy shop fronts and stuff like that. So yeah, um, but yeah. And don't be scared to ask the sale person and put the hard, hard word on them, what's your experience? Because if they're talking rubbish or whatever else, it might be worth going somewhere else and getting another opinion. Oh, and I would also say rent before you buy, if possible. Like with boots and stuff, it's pretty hard. Um, but you know, there's good boot fitters around that can fix that, fix those issues. But like with skis and stuff, there's always demo days on the mountains uh, where you can go and test the latest ski or, or whatever else, or you know, pay to rent them for a day or something like that. And you'll actually know whether you like the gear. Um, it's not just some paid reviewer online doing it. So that's my take on that. Um, Definitely, I know my wife's watching today, but uh, if she knew how much money I'd wasted over the years on buying cheap gear, uh, she'd probably kill me, so I won't go into a dollar figure. But uh, I would definitely say buy quality or, or buy twice or thrice or four times. So yeah, um, good gear does cost. There is absolutely no doubt about it. Um, and yeah, sometimes it does take a lot of sacrifice to get that good gear, but it, nine out of 10 times uh, with warranties these days and stuff like that, it'll pay for itself. And if you divide, like I actually worked out the other day, my jacket that I paid way too much for, how many days I'd skied in it. Um, yeah, it's working out at about 40 cents a day or something like that for every day I've worn it. So yeah, in, in, in the scheme of things, it, is it really that expensive? Probably not if you divide it over its whole lifetime. And the last one with gear selection I'll cover is the proper fitting of boots and skis. Um, as I sort of touched on in the intro to gear selection, uh, a lot of people buy stuff online and they're like, man, I just bought this set of 26.5 boots because they were like 400 bucks cheaper than my size and I'm a 28.5 and I'll make them fit. And then two hours into a tour when your toenails hanging off and you, you got blisters or whatever else, you think, damn it. And you're gonna go buy another set of boots and hop those ones on Gumtree for 200 bucks less than you bought them for. Um, yeah, so m make sure the gear fits and don't really, don't skimp for, you know, what in the scheme of things, what's a couple hundred bucks? It's an expensive sport. It is what it is. Again, my opinion, but yeah, just just make sure it fits. Get the right length. Um, don't sell yourself short just because it's on sale. Yeah, online or whatever. Um, yeah. All right. Risk management. So uh, I just want to give a massive shout out actually to the Mountain Sports Collective down in Harrietville. So they are basically the next or part of the risk management thing. Uh, if you're not a member of it absolutely jump online, get one of their awesome maps. I don't know if they got their hoodies back in stock, but um, they are, especially in Victoria, I think they're moving up into New South Wales, but they're, they're a force in the industry. Um, they've got amazing people that are passionate about snow and they release, I think they're on Instagram, MSC, Mountain Sport Collective. Um, they release snow uh, reports most days or when it's fresh snow anyway. Um, very, very, very cool, very good resource. And at the moment, very underutilized. So uh, yeah, jump online, 40, 50 bucks for a membership, free map included. Um, yeah, so check them out. So that is with the weather and snow, those guys are a huge resource. And again, as I touched on in the intro, um, there's about 10, you know, you know, there's limitless apps out there to, to get. So to jump on, um, there's heaps of forums about which ones to use or whatever. Uh, and, and play them off against each other and see which ones are working, what, what works, what doesn't. Some years they work, some years they don't. Um, and keep checking that right up to the point of stepping off or even while you're out there on the, on the ski tour or whatever in the back country, um, summer or winter, the mountains, you know, they're unpredictable. Um, if you've got reception, check the weather, see if there's a front rolling in or something like that and uh, keep, you, keep yourself out of trouble. Um, Another big one uh, for risk management is navigation. So everyone's got a smartphone these days, you know, we're all watching this on Zoom or whatever. Um, so yeah, smart tops, laptop, smartphones, and all that, they've all got batteries. They're all vulnerable to a certain degree, as in the batteries can overheat, can freeze, they can just stop. Um, 
yeah, same with GPSs. So everyone's super reliant on, on their technology. I know there's a bunch of people uh, out there doing like old school map compass navigation, there's orienteering clubs and all that sort of stuff. Um, massive believer in backup compass, you know, uh, doesn't need batteries, close in the dark, uh, it works regardless of white out weather, doesn't need signal. Um, yeah, really, really good and underutilized resource. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you do carry GPS or anything like that, um, spare batteries, or if you carry a phone, a battery bank, make sure you've got cables, make sure it's charged and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you, you've got to give yourself or arm yourself and give yourself the best chance of success. Um, and that, that basically means um, backups for backups for backups. Uh, and actually on that as well, uh, if you're planning on using your phone for navigation in a whiteout or something like that, Go out and try it in summer or try it in you know winter or whatever go out on a bad day when it's a pea soup day and see if your offline maps or whatever work you know do it relatively safely in the resort or whatever but just see if you you know if you're doing google maps and saving them offline or whatever um yep all right so uh next thing is avi gear um transceivers shovels probes i recommend carrying them always um please make sure you, if they're in your group that everyone's got them and you have a protocol for using them. Um, yeah, they are massive resource, but yeah, you gotta spend time using them. Sorry, I'm running out of time guys. I gotta uh, sort of get through this. Uh, emergency contacts, um, make sure that someone knows you're going and make sure that uh, someone's expecting you. And if, they, if, you, if you're not back when you're expected, get them to you know, have, have a procedure in place that you've talked through before it happens. And yeah, and I'll just go back to the av the um, avalanche courses and stuff like that. I recommend do one and make sure if you do one um, or an intro tour or something like that, if you're out in the back country, make sure they cover shovels, peeps, probes and how to use them and actually go and bury a transceiver in a backpack and go through the whole search. Um, it, it is along with fitness, it is the foundation of the back country uh, and it's a really 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 important all right i think that's about us um i think daniel we're going to go to some questions or something like that yes we've got a few questions coming through now we're short on time so uh, if you wouldn't that? mind sticking around uh after we uh swing to the transition i think there'll probably be a couple more questions that uh, you can answer via text uh in the q a section uh, straight up, uh, one from uh, Anne, who unfortunately wasn't able to add it to the Q&A, so I'll, I'll go with her first. Uh, she was wondering as to what your preferences for software are and if you can rattle off a couple of your favourite go-to apps and planning tools. Software, so I use Weather Underground, uh, YR Weather, Windy, uh, The Bomb, which is because of the radar, and... Uh, yeah, I reckon that's about it. I, I sort of play those ones off against each other. They're, they're usually pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I'm also curious about what, uh, what your average day pack weighs and uh, in extension to that, uh, what an overnight pack, say for a five day trip in Australia where you have to allow for snow camping, uh, how much you're looking at carrying typically? Uh, a day pack? Look, I, I, I don't know the weight, but I would say, like I carry 1.5 litres of water, shovel, peak probe, spare jacket, spare pants, spare gloves. Uh, no, not spare jacket, spare pants, gloves. I don't know. I'd say it's in vicinity of 3.5 to 5 kilos for a day trip. And if you go on five days, you're probably looking at a 70 litre rucksack with, I'd actually put another day pack in it to do day trips from it. So I don't know, heavy, I don't know, 15, 20 kilos, something like that, I would imagine. Yeah, not light. Uh, I think yeah, I think my first ever overnight trip, I uh, carried a tad over uh, thirty kgs. Probably, yeah. And, and you look back and you're like, man, I didn't and snowshoes. Yeah, it's uh, it's not light, that's for sure. No. Uh, we uh, we have a question here from uh, Kelly. Uh, who would like to thank you for ho highlighting an overlooked but extremely important factor in any tour regarding group dynamics and how you manage them and mitigate uh, undesirable dynamics. She uh, follows that up with, what's your best advice for managing group dynamics with varying personalities and cognitive biases, especially once you're out there? 
I would say um, you always have, uh, be flexible. As in, if you've started out with four or five people in a group or ideally whatever, it doesn't matter, and the dynamics aren't working for some reason, like there's a different appetite for risk or ego or whatever it may be, I would say don't be scared to split into smaller groups um, based on, you know, goals or ability or whatever else. Like, it, it don't, fix, don't have a fixed mindset. Like, we went out with five, we've got to go back with five. You know, it might be, well, uh, we're, us two, we're going to go over here and do that, and you three are going to do that. And, you know, we'll stay on comms and we'll work it out from there. Yeah. She follows that up with a question about uh, decision making and uh, whether you prefer pecking order dynamics or democracy dynamics in terms of making group decisions and if you can give pros and cons on either side. Thanks, Gail. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, like I, I, I try to do serious mission, me personally, um, I try to do the serious, more serious ski mountaineering missions in two. And it's a 50-50 vote, that's it. And if someone says no, that's it. Like, uh, to be honest, I'm not a big advocate of, uh, I mean, this is me personally, obviously I run a guiding business, so it's a, that's a different story. But me personally, when I go to do goal-orientated missions, like I'm going to ski that cool while I'm going to, for that peak, I try and do it in as small as group as possible to negate a lot of those factors. And it's with people who I've skied with before and mountaineered or whatever with a lot before. So I guess it negates a lot of that. A lot of that. I think, yeah, it's, it's a super tough one. Like uh, I honestly, I don't, I don't know if I can properly give that a, ju a fully justified answer in such a short amount of time. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Megan Casey has asked a question about uh, some advice on split boards for women. I think uh, that's probably one that's best answered offline because yeah. that's a... So, uh, drop us an email at contact at rollsports.com.au. Um, my wife, awesome split boarder, basically born with a split board on. We'll be happy to answer any questions or our number is 035759 Just give us a yell. Okay, that's pretty uh, simple. Thanks very much for your time.